Thank you to the organizers at Nan Tien Institute for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm presenting today on research that arises from a number of projects on Buddhism in Australia and Buddhism in the far north of Australia in particular that I'm conducting with uh, colleagues, Enchi Wang, uh, Christina Rocha, Sue Smith, and Ruth Fitzpatrick, and also Kim Lam um, at Deakin University, Western Sydney University, and Charles Darwin University. Today, I'm going to focus on the traditional and ultra-modern adaptations and responses to racism. And here I use the word ultra-modern um, in a similar way that you would uh, perhaps use other terms such as post-modern um, and uh, late-modern um, and um, bracketed here to indicate the awareness that in contemporary Buddhism, traditional and modern approaches are often quite um, intertwined. So Paul Crouch's History of Buddhism in Australia describes the planting of two Bodhi tree saplings said to be related to the tree under which the Buddha gained enlightenment on Thursday Island, known as Ti, in the far north of Australia in the late 19th century by a cohesive little Buddhist community of Sinhalese from Sri Lanka. The trees were said to be still flourishing in 1989, but the temple which the community constructed was no longer there. Croucher observed how this reflected the truth of the Buddhist epitaph on a Sinhalese gravestone, Sabha Sankara Anika, or impermanent are all component things. In fact, the Bodhi trees, or rather the single tree, perished soon after World War II, but Saranilis House, a Singhalese jewellery store, built in 1897, the pink building in that picture, which is remains yeah, largely intact in TI's main street, and also Leifu's grocery store, the Japanese and Chinese sections of the TI graveyard, and frangipani trees gifted to the TI cathedral by the Singhalese. The enduring presence of descendants of the Japanese, Chinese, and Sri Lankan families who lived in TI when it was a booming pearling town in the turn of the 20th century is also evident in the TI community. The spread of Buddhism into Australia is typically thought to have occurred a century later in the late 20th century, which increased immigration following the lifting of the 1901 Immigration Restriction Act, known as the White Australia Policy, and the ending of the Vietnam, of the Vietnam War. Prior research on the arrival of Buddhism in Australia has also focused largely on the activities of 20th century modern white Buddhists in southern states. Buddhists are currently Australia's third largest religious group, comprising 2.4% of the population, following Christians at 52.1% and Muslims at 2.6%. And Buddhists currently enjoy a higher positive public image in Australia than other religious minorities. Australian teens also have a strong interest in practices related to Buddhism, such as mindfulness and meditation, and a strong belief in concepts such as karma and reincarnation. What is little known in and beyond Australia is that Buddhism and Buddhist deity symbols and rituals first arrived through flows of workers and migrants from Asia, particularly from China, Japan, and Sri Lanka, as early as the mid 19th century gold rush. The largest of these early Asian populations were across the far north of Australia in Broome, Darwin, Thursday Island, Cooktown and Cairns. And here are some images from the temple in Darwin in the Northern Territory. Regina Gantner writes that if we turn the map upside down and start Australian history where its documentation properly begins in the North, the kaleidoscope of Australian history falls into a completely different pattern. She adds that it makes nonsense of the idea of an isolated continent, given Australia's proximity to New Guinea and Asia, as until World War II, whites were heavily outnumbered in the North by close-knit Asian and Indigenous communities with a history of close relations. Indeed, it was in large part fears regarding the high numbers and success of Chinese and Japanese communities, including Buddhist, Taoists and Confucians in the far north of Australia, that led to the passing of the Immigration Restriction Act in 1901. While prior research has documented and focused on race relations 
in the north of Australia, particularly between Indigenous Asian and European Australians, there's been very little emphasis placed on the religious dimensions of these encounters in this scholarship and of the religious lives of these Asian workers and migrants. Our research on Buddhism in Australia and particularly the far north of Australia addresses the marginalization of Asian Buddhism in scholarship on Buddhism in Australia and scholarship on re religion in Australia more broadly. It does this by making more visible the lived hybrid and complex religions of early Asian communities living in Australia and the triangulated relations between Indigenous Asian European Australians. In so doing, it challenges the fantasy of a white Christian nation. This follows more recent developments in scholarship on Buddhism that have similarly sought to recenter Asian and Indigenous voices in the early development of Buddhism in the United States. And here is another photograph of images uh, from Broome in the west of the north of Australia. According to Anne Glegg, post-colonial Buddhism refers to the scholarship on Buddhism, which critiques the consequences of imperialism and colonialism by reinserting the contributions of Asian Buddhist communities into articulations of religion in the West. This work can be considered an attempt to correct a so-called ethno sangha oversight in the US, a term coined by Gary L. Ray and acknowledged by Buddhist studies scholars during this time to describe the phenomena whereby Asian Buddhist practices and temples were excluded in references to Western Buddhism. In Australia, post-colonial analysis have been less prevalent in scholarship on Buddhism. Enid Adam, Philip Hughes and Gordon Waite have shown that contemporary Asian Buddhist communities have experienced racism and racialization in the form of vandalism of temples and difficulties obtaining planning permits for the construction of temples. Kim Lam's research on Buddhist youth in Australia has also found that the racialization of Buddhism as an Asian religion in Australia shapes both Asian and non-Asian background Buddhist practitioners into cultural relations. Lam's research has found that perceptions of Buddhism as an Asian religion contribute to the minimization and concealment of young Buddhist practitioners' religious activities in white multicultural Australia and render Buddhism less visible in the public sphere as a result. In addition, and as mentioned um, at the beginning of this presentation with regards to Crouch's study, there has been scant mention in existing scholarship of the contributions of Asian Buddhist communities in Australia before the 20th century and a much greater focus on the activities of white Buddhists. Findings from our Buddhist Life Stories of Australia project began to address this and concurred with Rocha and Barker's earlier characteristics, or many of them, of Buddhism in Australia. The Buddhist Life Stories in Australia late study was a digital oral history crowdfunded pilot project initiated and led by me in 2015 to 2016, where we recorded 19 interviews with prominent Australian, Asian and Anglo-Buddhist um, European leaders, including from Tibet, Thailand, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, China and Taiwan. Um, our team also observed significant levels of appreciation and cooperation between lay and monastic and Asian and Anglo-European Buddhists and a deep connection to the Australian landscape through Buddhist concepts of space and stillness as additional characteristics of Buddhism in Australia mentioned by both uh, Asian Buddhist and Anglo-European Buddhist leaders alike. This project, however, was a relatively small endeavor and research on Buddhism in Australia has never really received substantive funding or scholarly attention in broader studies of religion in Australia compared to research on the so-called Abrahamic faith of Christianity, Judaism or Islam. The persistent racism faced by Asian Buddhists and also their relative invisibility in Australian history, studies of religion and even in research on Buddhism in Australia can perhaps best be understood by drawing on the work of Australian scholars focusing on whiteness and race relations. Anthropologist Gassan Haj states in White Nation that whiteness is a crucial component of Australianness as white Australians have constructed themselves as governors and rendered non-white, including Indigenous and Asian Australians, as passive objects to be governed according to a white national will. Racism is both numerological and ex existential, according to Hajj, regarding the scale of migration um, and also uh, racism of disgust at difference and a belief in the superiority of whiteness. Haj further explains how in the white nation fantasy, the non-white presence is viewed as one that poses problems and fear is directed towards the aggressively independent and political non-whites 
the Aboriginal people and the migrants who deploy an Australian will outside the supervisory tentacles of white governmentality. By contrast, what Hajj refers to as the multicultural real is pervasive and enduring. This is certainly evident in the cultural and religious diversity of the far north. And here you can see new shoots of Buddhism in the Northern Territory, a, a little Bodhi tree and a Cambodian Buddhist temple in uh, a mango orchard, as well as the Buddhist statue um, in the Buddhist Society of the Northern Territory in Darwin. What we have found is very much evident in the strong material record of the lived religious beliefs and rituals across the far north of Australia of Buddhism, present not only in temples, sacred trees, cemeteries and personal, personal shrines, but also in the livelihoods and economic successes of the earlier Asian migrants, which continues to this day. As Gantner concludes, if we start to write Australian history from north to south instead of the other way around, we must straight away give up the idea of Anglo-Celts at the centre of the Australian universe. We also need to look at the triangulated relationships between whites, Asians and Aborigines and that once we look at the whole continent instead of its southern half, the moment of Anglo-Celtic dominance appears very brief from the end of World War II until the 1970s only. And the same can be said about Christian or Abrahamic faith dominance also. So while the abolishment of the white Australia policy and a shift towards multicultural policies to embrace cultural diversity in the 1970s and 80s led to an appreciation of diverse cultures and religions in Australia, racism against Chinese and Asian Australians continues to be a persistent and problematic issue that has been heightened by the current coronavirus pandemic. Research reveals that in contemporary populism centered on exclusionary nationalism, whiteness continues to inform and construct ethnic and religious minorities as others within Australian media and political discourses. The retelling of history with more accuracy and stressing Australia's cultural and religious diversity, hybridity and complexity is a powerful tool to deconstruct the myth of a white Christian nation created by the 1901 racist policy imposed due to numerical and existential racism regarding migration from Asia. Our research also reveals a tireless resistance to this racism and a strong resilience among Asian and Buddhist Australians in the face of ongoing exclusion to assert their rightful place in this nation. Thank you.